Once again, we've gathered to continue our discussion of Sabbath rest. And this time, we come together for session seven, Sabbath, a time to release. I want to tell a story. It is a true story. And like most stories, it begins with words like long, long ago, far, far away. There was a man named Nils. Now, Nils was a nobleman in this fine country where he lived. He had much land, many servants, and he really didn't have to work for a living. The land was passed on to him from his ancestors, and he had a nice wife and several sons. The oldest son was known by the name of Victor. Victor had the privilege of being the one who would inherit this land as the firstborn child. And uh, he enjoyed his father's place of living, the land. He made use of the land, going on little trips. He'd fish in the ponds. He would hunt in the valleys. He would enjoy his time on the father's land for many years as a teenager and a young man. Now he was told by his father that all this land would be his. He would inherit the land and all the servants would be his to serve him at his pleasure. But there was one thing that he must not do. As one who was the eldest son, he was not to marry a commoner. He was of noble stature. He was a privileged person in his country. If he married a commoner, a peasant girl, he would lose all this privileged position, the land, the use of all the privileges of having servants, and he'd be disinherited from the land. It would no longer be his to farm, to enjoy the lakes, the trees, and everything that came with his nobility. Now, uh, Victor went out from time to time, quite often actually, and roamed the land of his father. But on one occasion, one of his hunting trips took him to the edge of his father's property, and he had to stop. He happened to stop at this little cottage. And he met this widow lady. And it wasn't the widow lady that he was so interested in. He noticed the widow's daughter. And the daughter's name was Matilda. And he took a liking to Matilda, and they began to talk more often. And when Victor went home to his parents in the evening after hunting, he no longer had rabbits or an occasional deer. He no longer came home with fish. And his father, Nils, would ask him, now, Victor, I understand you've been hunting, but why don't you bring game home for us to eat? We don't have to eat that game. We have other food. But you like to hunt so much. I'm wondering, is your aim now bad? He said. Oh, no, Father, well, the animals are more scarce, scarce these days. And this happened to, to go on for some time. And uh, then one day he came to his father and said, uh, Father, I've, I've met someone, met someone that I like very much. And uh, he said, oh, well, that's interesting. I, is this uh, a young man, a friend of yours? Uh, well, not exactly, Father, it's a young lady. Oh, well, uh, what's her name? I'm sure she's of noble class. Is that correct? Well, not exactly, Father. Uh, her name is Matilda. Matilda, I don't, I don't remember any Matilda of noble stature. We don't know this Matilda. Where does she live? Well, down yonder, over the hill and in the valley, and there's a cottage there. A cottage? Victor. Is she a commoner, a peasant girl? Well, Victor said, yes, she is. I've warned you, you better break off this relationship, Victor, because if you marry a commoner, you will be disinherited from all the privileges of being of noble stature. This land, this property will no longer be yours to enjoy. So keep that in mind. Well, as time went on, Victor's love of property became less and less, and his love of Matilda became greater 
and they saw each other more and more. And what became a friendship has now become a love story, a relationship with one another. And uh, it, it's sort of like a movie. A movie, perhaps you've heard of this movie, Pride and Prejudice, where a man of noble stature meets a young light lady, and, and she's a commoner. And eventually, Victor comes to the point of having courage to say to his father, Father, Matilda and I are in love, and we've decided to get married. Married? Victor, how can this be? I told you that you would lose your nobility. You would no longer have the privileges of being on this land if you marry a commoner. You go ahead and make your decision. Just keep that in mind, Victor. I'll keep my word. Love was stronger than blood relationship in his life. And sure enough, Victor and Matilda had decided to get married. Now the people I speak of, Victor and Matilda, are not as good looking as these people. They got married and yes, Victor was disinherited from his land, so he left his homeland of Sweden. And he came to America, and they traveled inland into the country until they found a climate worse than the one they left in Sweden. So they settled in Minnesota, a very cold place, uh, like Kursk, Russia, even colder Moscow, maybe almost like Siberia. Well, not quite that cold. But anyway, that's what happened to them. And they began to work hard with their hands. I suppose that Victor probably didn't have calluses on his hand because he was a nobleman. But now he had to work hard in the fields and especially in the forest to log wood and so forth. And there we have a picture of Victor and Matilda. Uh, they're the ones on the left, if you're not sure. They're the ones on the left, Victor and Matilda. Uh, and Victor now had to work with horses. He had to train horses and work with them and, and, and log heavy timber out of the woods. And they had a life for themselves. And eventually they had their own children in Minnesota. They went from logging to farming. And they began to have their children. One of them was called Elmer. And Elmer worked very, very hard as well. He was a man who never retired himself. He worked hard first logging, first with horses, and then he worked uh, with trucks, old trucks, but big logs as you can see them as he cleared much of the forest in central Minnesota and other places. And then he changed his line of work from working with wood to working with large slabs of stone, granite as they are, huge pieces of stone. He began to truck them out of the quarries. And he then had a son, and his son's name was Harold. And Harold worked hard as well. And this is a very significant picture of Harold and his wife. This is their second born child, and a very special time in my life. You can look at the uh, license plate here, and maybe you can see a 51 there. Uh, that was me. That was me as an infant, and that was the year I was born, 1951. Yes, you can count up the years and figure out that I'm now an old man. I'm 60. But that's not the important part. The important part is that my father, during the time that this picture was taken, was very ill. Actually, he was recovering from rheumatic fever, uh, a problem that he had that caused him to be in the hospital for some 15 weeks during the time in which I was born. He often told the story of, of how he was a uh, driving truck. And he got so tired day after day, week after week, driving in all conditions that he became very ill. And he went into a restaurant. And he sat on the stool. And he almost fell over. He was so ill. From that point on, for several weeks, he was admitted into the hospital. And uh, that happened when he was about 35 years of age. I had a similar experience when I was almost 30 years of age. I wasn't driving truck, or I wasn't doing that kind of heavy labor that he had to do, but I was pastoring a church. And we were planting a church, and church planting is extremely difficult, a very big challenge in any place of the world. But I was working day and night, and I have to say, I, I would work pretty much like 
seven days a week. I would take a day off, but that would be for mowing the lawn and doing other things. And there were certain problems in the church that made life very difficult for me, and I began to worry on top of it. And on top of that, we had a second-born son, a child, and, and he had ear problems, and he'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming. And between the problems that I was worrying about in the church and working many days of the week, and, and this child that wake up screaming, I wasn't sleeping well. And this went on for maybe six months or so. Finally, one morning, I woke up, and I, uh, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't believe it. I was not even 30 years of age, but I felt very, very old. I was so weak and tired, and I was running a fever, and I was so ill, and I'd never experienced anything like it. It was a physical breakdown as a young man. How could this happen to me? What has gone wrong? And I had to learn the hard way that uh, one can, can worry themselves, can work themselves to a point of death, near death, work themselves to the edge of life. And there I was, for six weeks I was in bed. I had something called mononucleosis, the breakdown of the cells, and then hepatitis, with that, which has to do with the liver. But it was basically because of fatigue, ignoring my body, ignoring the rest that I needed. And it became a very frightening time in our lives. And I learned that prolonged illnesses can work yourself to death. You can work yourself to the edge of death. And as a young person, you think that you can just reach down deep within yourself and pull up some life reserves, some more energy. But after doing that so many times, so long, there's nothing left, even though you're young. And you can worry yourself to death. I, I told you that I was a worrier. Yes, uh, my mother taught me how to worry. My dad taught me how to work hard. Uh, but wherever I got it, I got both of these, the work hard and the worry much. And you can drive yourself over the edge. And here's an illustration that you might see uh, with this particular picture of a pickup truck that is hanging, dangling over uh, a cliff there with a boat. And you can see that uh, it's a good thing that the boat is a big boat and holding the pickup. And you can see a man that is then in the pickup truck, if you look at that with great detail. Now, after all this is going on, I'm very weak and tired. Meanwhile, there is my wife, Lois, and the two boys. And I'll ask Lois just how she felt about all of this illness and worry. Um, the illness was very scary because I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if, if he was going to live or die because they really didn't know what was wrong. He was just exhausted. He was in bed, so I was taking care of... Um, a man, um, my husband, and sometimes at night the fever would rise and you know when you get a fever sometimes you you sweat and his the sweating would be so bad that I would have to help him change his clothes and I have to change the sheets because things would be wet. Um, the doctors told me in private that if I let the stress get too high or let him talk to someone on the telephone that would cause stress, it could be enough to send it into the type of hepatitis that was contagious. And uh, that we didn't want because that meant that there was a potential of um, all of us being quarantined to our house. And at this point, our second son was only 10 months old, so we had an infant. And, and then we had our other son who was um, had just turned seven, so there's there six, six years between our boys. And so it was really scary. Um, I didn't know what God was doing. I didn't know what God was allowing in our lives, but I was scared. And we were a long way away from where our parents lived. Um, if you looked on a map um, of the United States, we lived in kind of the center of the United States, which was Iowa and our families lived in um, northern Minnesota. Um, so they were a long way away. So it wasn't like we had somebody close by who could really help us. Um, I will say that our little church, which was just a church plant, it wasn't very large, they rallied around us. And um, 
the men of the church would come over and help me by mowing the lawn and um, sometimes making repairs on our home that had to be done during that, that period where um, Jim was in bed. But a lot of the things that were going on inside of me, I had to keep to myself. I couldn't share them with him because it would add more stress and uh, very likely make him more sick. So there were a lot of things that were happening between me and God. Um, most of the time, I was just trying to get through the day of taking care of two sons and taking care of a sick husband. Um, one of the things that Jim remembers that I don't remember very well is that um, his dad would call every day and talk to him and that was a great encouragement to him because he'd walked this road. He'd been in a hospital bed for 15 weeks. Um, but that was a source of encouragement to Jim during this time. There were so many conflicting things that were going on inside of me. What was I going to do if I lost my husband? Where was I going to go? How was I going to take care of my two sons and myself? I didn't know. I didn't know. So these are all the kinds of things that were going on inside of me as this illness is, is taking place um, inside of Jim's body. And I think I was really just living the way God wants us to, and that was day to day because I didn't know what the next day was going to bring. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And I should uh, just let you know that these events happened before we had actually established a time of Sabbath rest. These were the early stages of learning, first of all, about the necessity of physical, emotional rest. We hadn't gotten to the deeper part of the spiritual rest of meeting with God in deep ways and solitary places. It was simply rest that our bodies needed, and I needed to stop worrying. So it became a real stepping stone to other lessons of rest. Do you have to take care of yourself? From that point on, I realized that when I got tired, I had to stop. I had to. I never wanted um, that to happen again. This memory of being very ill was etched into my mind. And so when I felt deep fatigue coming on because I'd worked long hours in many days, I stopped. If I felt an illness coming on, I would stop and let my body repair. From that point on, I seldom have been ill, nothing serious. Uh, nothing long-term at all. Uh, so it was a wonderful lesson to learn fairly young in my life before I was even 30. And uh, to anyone out there who has abused themselves by working to such an extent, beware. Beware. You can work or worry yourself to death. Beware. And take this lesson from myself to yourself, lest you put your life in danger in a similar fashion. Let me tell you too that at this point as a young pastor and pastor's wife, we knew that we had to do ministry differently, but we hadn't really learned the <coughs> lesson yet. Uh, we knew it had to look different because if we continued on the course that we were on, um, one or both of us could be very sick. And we also knew that we weren't doing good things for our boys, that they were going to pay a price um, for our, our um, continued activity. Um, and if that would lead to the death of one of us, that was not a good thing um, for our son. So at this point, we knew we had to do life and ministry different, but we didn't know what that looked like. Sometime thereafter, I came across a rewriting of the psalm, the 23rd psalm. And part of our working hard as a family and our heritage is really our view of God. 
Our view of God as being a foreman or a boss over us who would only be pleased if we worked really hard and accomplished things for Him. And while we know the original 23rd Psalm that says, the, word, the Lord is my shepherd, I'm afraid I lived and others live like this kind of a Psalm, this kind of a, a, a God is before us who is our foreman, our boss, uh, who is constantly trying to get more and more out of us. Uh, Lois is going to read the workaholic 23rd Psalm for us. The Lord is my foreman, I shall not rest. He makes me mow down the green pastures. He leads me to generators beside rapid waters. He wears out my soul. He shoves me to conferences for my schedule's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of relaxation, I fear no chance of rest, for my feelings of guilt, they haunt me. Thou dost prepare a work table before me in the presence of my comrades. Thou hast filled my mind with worry. My workload overflows. Surely busyness and pressure will follow me all the days of my life, and I will run to and fro in the house of the Lord forever. Now, whoever you are out there, wherever you are, take a moment to circle or underline or just write down these words, any of them that pertain to you. Are you a worrier? You might write down the word or circle the word worry. Are you one who is driven by guilt? You might write down that word. You might say, I believe God is my foreman, not my Lord and my shepherd. And so you write that down. And so what is it? Admit honestly how this workaholic psalm has become your view of God and your view of life and His requirements of you. And be honest. Now, if you have trouble being honest with yourself, you might ask a spouse, if you're married, a husband or wife, to help you do this. They will say, uh, 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 you always worry. You might say, no, I don't. Yes, you do. You worry, circle worry. Okay. Or better yet, a child. Children are brutally honest. They come right out and say what they think. Mommy, 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 daddy, daddy, uh, you, you are so full of guilt. You just, you're driven. You run to, to and fro in God's house all the time, doing, doing, doing. Uh, so uh, a person may help you be honest with this particular psalm and this particular assignment. Uh, the workaholic 23rd Psalm. But then take time to meditate on the real 23rd Psalm where we see the Lord Himself is quite different than we made Him to be.